I'm uh, William Stuart Bueller. Right now I'm 78. I uh, went to the University of Michigan in 1952, graduated in 56. I went there to get a commission in the Navy in the NROTC uh, as a regular officer. So I was there four years and uh, uh, graduated as an ensign and was stationed uh, first uh, ship. I was in the surface uh, Navy uh, as um, a, r a regular fleet officer, line officer. So as an ensign, uh, my first ship was a Buckley class destroyer escort left over from World War II and that was assigned to the fleet uh, sonar school San Diego as a school ship so uh, my first uh, few years were I ran hundreds of hours of officer of the deck uh, conning the ship over a submarine running uh, simulated attacks giving our uh, enlisted sonarmen uh, the students uh, training and ping time on the sub so that was my first assignment uh, through the years, uh, I, I remained in the Navy until 1976 and received a permanent con commission then as a commander. Um, uh, after the Navy, I went to uh, American University for several years in their religion department. and. Uh, did some special research of my own in uh, biblical Judeo-Christian uh, deep studies and I have s uh, then was ordained uh, as a minister in a liberal um, and independent Catholic church. Uh, they um, recognized the mysteries and encouraged that kind of work so that's deeply involved me since then. My any submarine training, sonar associated operations and, and so forth, um, due to my experience uh, as a qualified OD on that uh, destroyer escort and uh, knew quite a bit about um, submarine ops um, and uh, ASW ops just by being there, although I was engineer officer at the time. Um, uh, still, I received a lot of experience, so I had orders that after that to uh, USS Bennington. That was an Essex-class aircraft carrier uh, from World War II, and it had been changed from a TAC carrier to a CVS, or an anti-submarine uh, carrier, uh, uh, in a hunter-killer group at that time. So I was um, assigned as ASW officer, to anti-submarine warfare officer, uh, to that carrier, um, which was in, the, in that ship um, operations job. Uh, so they sent me to um, um, the sonar school because it was being equipped with an actual sonar, and the aircraft carrier was. So I got a lot of, um, and that's basically for an enlisted uh, training in, in uh, sonar, uh, a lot of uh, time listening to the sub uh, uh, echoes and, and marine life and, and so forth and how to actually work the sonar stack and, and all of that. So I went through the full course in that as part of the prep for um, this carrier work. and. Um, so I spent um, a couple of years aboard uh, in very intensive hunter-killer operations. This was in the Pacific, and home ported uh, out of Long Beach, um, and uh, uh, some time in San Diego. Uh, so a great deal of training in anti-submarine warfare, and that that was at that time. Uh, we, our squadrons were S2F, Grumman S2F, 
uh, fixed-wing airplanes. Uh, we had two squadrons, and then a squadron of uh, ASW Helos and um, AD-5W. They were uh, converted uh, um, guppies, they called them, because they had the big uh, radar antenna underneath, and so they ran radar patrols for the ASW ops. So th those were the aircraft that we worked with. So my job is mainly in combat, CIC, uh, and uh, training the officers in, in ASW, and writing reports and so forth, uh, uh, and also as an interface, um, or, um, uh, I interacted with the, our destroyer ASW officers to some degree. Um, uh, I also, after that, after Bennington, uh, was assigned as a training officer in the anti-submarine warfare school at San Diego. And uh, at that time, the officer and uh, air controllers and in, in the destroyers um, were not receiving the training they should have in ASW. They were being trained by the air defense uh, uh, school there at San Diego, which was good air defense training, but not so good for ASW. So the job was given to the ASW school, and I was there and uh, had the experience in the carrier and all of that. So uh, the course was mine to invent and write up and uh, minister, and I worked harder than that I ever have in the Navy. Uh, many hours, and we had actual subs and aircraft to uh, practice with, and had to come up with uh, new tactics, actually, write the whole curriculum, tests, and so forth. And it was, uh, and train ESW air controllers, which included senior chiefs, uh, radarman chiefs mainly. The, uh, I had the training in both uh, sonar and radar, uh, not so much in the radar equipment, just in the operation in the normal uh, CIC watch uh, operation of the radars. But uh, the main thing was tactics. So, uh, and, and how to work with both of the, in, with sonarmen your sonar stations and, the, and your general quarters team and the radar and combat stations and, and with, at that time, our anti-submarine air controllers were stationed in combat as well as one up on the bridge of the destroyer. So they could have visual uh, control really close in, even in the several hundred yards from the ship because they had helos dipping the ships launching hedgehogs up in the air, uh, S2Fs coming in really low on MAD or magnetic detection sweeps uh, very close to the water. Uh, so all of this air activity going on all around the ship, couple ships making alternate attacks. That was a basic uh, environment that these uh, air controllers had to work in. So I had to teach that in the in the uh, school. Uh, so it was mainly tactics uh, and operations uh, as far as actually working the, the radar, the controller, of course, would have to be able to do that. And uh, so there was a very strenuous and demanding curriculum that we came up with uh, and actually flunked about 10% of the um, officers as well as chiefs. Uh, chiefs with years in, uh, they had to be able to uh, be uh, up in the uh, ability of, for the tactics. So they had to have that, basically an officer's qualification uh, in that particular area. Uh, and that's where they had more uh, difficulty with. So there were some uh, that, um, didn't make it through. Some 
controllers, we qualified them uh, as uh, uh, CIC qualified, passed them on the course, but not for air control where they had to be able to handle tactics as well as controlling the aircraft. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, 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 activity around that. Uh, then my next assignment um, was um, aboard Maddox as uh, operations officer. So that also got me back into ASW as well as air defense and the uh, other demands for that job. In 1964, I was in Maddox, and uh, uh, relative to the Gulf of Tonkin incident, uh, there had been a, a yearly intelligence cruise up into the Tonkin Gulf, uh, international waters every time, but we, uh, the U.S. would run a ship up there just to to demonstrate that we had the right to international waters and it wasn't a Chinese lake or a Vietnamese lake. And we, so we showed the flag and also collected whatever intelligence there you could, could from out in the middle or out in the Gulf beyond the, uh, um, the out in international waters. Thing is, as a note, North Vietnam had not designated just how far their international, uh, the, the boundary was. It was, uh, so uh, we used the Chinese uh, boundary and that, as I recall, was nine miles. So that was, so we were always outside of, of that. And we would uh, cruise the coast um, um, from the outside that uh, looking at it with telescopes, radar um, um, scans, and and uh, pretty much just routine, whatever was there. We'd look at the junks and the shipping and and so forth. Nothing really dr dramatic. So that was in that was, those patrols were called DeSoto patrols. Um, we started ours as I recall, on 31 July of uh, 64. And uh, we, it was a routine patrol up the coast. Um, then uh, and at the same time, however, South Vietnamese Navy was uh, running uh, PT strikes uh, against North Vietnamese ports. That was their own thing. We were not involved in that. And there are theories since then that we were, but uh, the, their strikes had started well before we even gotten into the area and actually had been completed, I think, by the time we arrived there. So we had, and we had nothing to do with that. Uh, on our way to the area, we stopped at uh, Formosa and picked up a uh, special uh, detachment, uh, an intelligence detachment uh, of Marines. And uh, so they came along with us. Uh, they had a Navy lieutenant as the officer in charge of that detachment. So that was the source of uh, some amount of information. and. Um, important information uh, for us anyway. Um, special clearance was required for that, which I was not given, in that our Commodore, uh, the task group force, uh, the task uh, uh, group commander, uh, Captain Herrick, uh, brought his staff operations officer with him and doctor, happily, and uh, uh, so they had the special clearance. RCO um, and XO had it also. Um, so that uh, special clearance was 
um, relevant to the detachment that we had on board and, and that information source. So we learned that, uh, well, uh, that we expected a detachment, uh, a sighted detachment north of the Vietnamese Navy, uh, patrol boats, PT boats that came down very close to us, transiting from the north to the south. Uh, they came quite close and uh, Commodore was, uh, I wouldn't say he was worried, but he it, it had his focused attention. Um, but they made no threatening moves, and nor did we. Uh, so they passed us with, uh, with no incident. In our group, we were one ship, uh, Maddox. And the, the, uh, we had been substituted because um, our class of destroyer carried uh, a double five-inch mount two of them forward and one aft. Uh, we were heavier armed than the, um, uh, I believe it was the uh, Fletcher class that we relieved. Uh, so that was one item that it was important. So we weren't really expecting problems, but we wanted to be ready for them if there were, so that we had that, that ship uh, shift. So then we only had the one ship in that DeSoto patrol. That was the that was typical. Um, and we had, as far as I know, no real strong communications or interaction with uh, the South Vietnamese Navy, and they were running what were uh, the, a nasty class PT boat, which is basically, as I recall, uh, Norwegian or Swedish but it was wooden, uh, so that they were running that class and that was all their operation. Ours was just simply steam up, collect information, go back, supposedly. Um, that's all we had to do. Uh, at least that's what was planned originally. Well, we were, as I recall, on the uh, 2nd of August. Uh, it was pretty routine at the beginning, but then we got, we had information that uh, uh, a strike was to be made against us by boats, by attack boats from North Vietnamese Navy, from a base that was quite close. Um, Where did this information come from? Our Marines. And um, so we began steaming out towards the middle of the Gulf. We were from international, from just outside international waters. Uh, so we were at least nine miles out. So we could see them coming, but we had already gotten steam up and were headed. Uh, full, full, well, about, um, as I recall, about 28, 29 knots. We would be pushing it hard at 32. So for us, 29 knots was, for that old World War II destroyer, that was pushing it fairly hard. Can you tell us where on the ship you were stationed? My, um, my station um, in general quarters uh, is on the bridge as the officer of the deck. I was assisted by John Bailey, a, or the junior officer of the deck. Um, and uh, my responsibility there was to um, um, handle the ship, uh, con, con the ship, or the JOD might con it. Uh, that by conning, I mean the actual rudder and engine orders given to the crew in the pilot house. We didn't steer anything, but we gave the orders. So conning the ship and also handling uh, radio communications in the, in the ship itself. Um, also, if we were attached to any other ships around to, to deal with communications in the larger group, there were no other ships around then. Um, and also any aircraft coming in to coordinate 
uh, or CIC and uh, uh, and so forth. The captain was in charge uh, of the whole ship, of course, from the bridge. So I worked mainly for him, but uh, I'm just about all, mainly autonomous. Uh, my job, uh, he, said he was always busy with the larger picture. So my picture is mainly in the ship and coordinating with anything outside of it through our regular um, teams aboard ship, CIC, sonar, gun control, main engine control, and, and so forth. Our uh, other main department head up on the bridge in general quarters was the gunnery officer. Uh, depending on what was going on, but uh, his station for this uh, incident was on the bridge, uh, directly under the captain's uh, direction. So the captain would be giving him in orders what to shoot at and so forth, uh, and leaving the control of the ship up to me. So that was mainly my job uh, and station. As I recall it, uh, the first uh, the time of day, uh, I'd have to check the the charts, but as I recall it, it was uh, somewhere midday. The day was bright, clear, um, no weather to speak of. Um, seas were moderate. Uh, The surface traffic, junks, was um, nothing much to worry about. Uh, we could see the uh, PTs at a distance and had them on radar. They were coming out fast. There were three of them um, and uh, in, in a close formation coming out in our direction. Uh, we continued. We, of course, went to general quarters, so I was up on the bridge myself. Uh, uh, at that time, um, uh, we were expecting uh, to be attacked. So uh, I remember that the um, captain asked me what would be the range where they would become a threat, and um, mainly uh, the. the Boats of that era, their weapon was a steam-driven, straight torpedo, uh, explosive, five, six hundred pounds explosive in uh, that steam torpedo. Same kind that uh, submarines in World War II used, PT boats, and same same weapon. Uh, the the, uh, the the their patrol craft were. Uh, they also had heavy machine guns. And um, they each had uh, two torpedoes. It was basically a Russian P-4 uh, PT boat. Uh, they had a large uh, um, radar antenna bulbous thing on a tripod up over the co cockpit. So they were easy to identify. So two torpedoes per boat, heavy machine gun, it's the main weapon. So they came out in a... Uh, in a in a line ahead column, high speed, um, and we were headed um, to the south. We didn't want to engage them, um, but we expected. So anyway, I told the captain the, the distance for this this type of torpedo, long range torpedo danger zone would be. Uh, 10,000 yards, which is five nautical miles. And, but that was extreme. So that's the distance he chose to fire a um, shot, five inch, uh, ostensibly a warning shot, but also one to get a uh, to, to be able to get an offset uh, reading on what to correct to put one on. Uh, so we shot that at about that range, maybe a little bit under that. Uh, 
they did not, uh, the, what happened uh, after the warning shot, they did not break off, uh, but kept on coming in. So we opened continuous fire at that time, uh, obviously to hit. Uh, we had a three inch uh, mount aft, uh, the five inch twin mount aft, and the two five inch uh, mounts forward, each double mount. Um, so we, uh, conti we get maximum continuous fire. Um, ordinarily when we fire the five inch uh, up forward, we open up the bottom of the bridge windows uh, so the concussion doesn't blow them out. No, back in World War II. It's, so we did that, but um, concussion um, ruptured all of our eardrums. Uh, we didn't, ordinarily we'd put cop, cotton in the ears, but we didn't have time for any of that. It would happen so fast. So everybody on the bridge had ruptured eardrums, and I have scar tissue there and loss of hearing, high frequencies. Um, coffee cups were flying from the concussion, uh, even though we tried to get them stowed away, and signal books, and uh, we were, you know, four or five inch blowing off right under your nose. So, I, so the ship was being whipped a great deal. Uh, I don't think we'd had a full battery firing like that as fast and hard uh, since the kamikaze raids in World War II. Back then the ship had been hit by a 500 pound bomb and the kamikaze. Korean War, it was, it was hit by a shore battery, blew out the radio room, shit. But we were really being whipped around. And uh, so all this uh, vibration in the ship, um, it severed some electric lines. Um, so I, I had a f report up on the bridge, electrical fire going. Uh, also report on the bridge that um, fire in the uh, in the magazine as it came up as far as the bridge what had happened the boats coming in uh, two of the three boats had started in uh, directly towards us uh, the head lead boat was opening out to get ahead of them to split our fire so we directed um, uh, our after mounts on the two boats coming in, um, and they were firing uh, heavy machine guns at the time. Uh, so one of the rounds went through um, a handling room for the um, three inch uh, and started uh, uh, the insulation and in it smoking. So the, the a little bit overstated report to the bridge said a fire in the magazine. So we had that to worry about. Also, also uh, at least bridge-wise, all this information coming in. Also, the concussion severed uh, water cooling lines to our air search radar. Uh, it was in a, a, we had complained about this for years, about the concussion rupturing these lines. It was really an aircraft radar system that had been adjusted for ships, but the fittings were were unsat. So anyway, the line ruptured, so we had no air search radar. Now our guys had uh, knew about the expected problems, so they had garden hoses there. So they rigged the garden hose, got the thing going up eventually. But meanwhile, we had airplanes inbound from the carrier uh, Tycho, the Ticonderoga, as, as I remember, was, was down south. So these planes were coming in. Ordinarily, we would be able to pick them up and control them in, but without the radar, we couldn't. Uh, it didn't bother them much. They homed in on our UHF's transmissions, so they eventually got there. Um, so anyway, we, that was one of the items up on the bridge that... Uh, had to deal with in one way or another. Um, 
So all of this was going on. And uh, we'd hit one boat, uh, and that was dead in the water and burning. The other boat was still coming in. Uh, we could see um, our shells would uh, five inch, the surface. We had point detonating fuses and VT, or proximity fuses, old World War, designed for Japanese zeros. Anyway, the VT, or the proximity fuse, would go off over the boat and then spray it with uh, shrapnel. And then the uh, de point detonating would actually go in the water and blow. So I remember seeing the boat, the whole front end of the boat blowing up out of the water uh, and then coming back down and the boat didn't slow down at all. These were aluminum built, Russian tough. Uh, so the, we were laying the shells right in on them. I could see pieces flying off from the boats, from the shrapnel hitting. So they were taking a lot of abuse from, from that fire, uh, from our fire. Uh, the one boat was still burning. Uh, the other boat was boring in, and it launched its two torpedoes. And when it launched, it swerved aside because uh, it was uh, going as fast as the torpedoes were, which 45 knots. So it turned to get out of the way. And it wouldn't interfere with the torpedoes. Now we noticed this maneuver again on the night of the 4th. And that was the maneuver we noticed on that night that keyed us in and it told us that, well, we've got a launch against us, we'd better. So on the 4th at that point, when we were tracking this in and it hooked off, we, I was on the bridge then, we, um, also, we, by then Turner Joy was with us, so we ordered an emergency turn, that, so both turn, ships turned together. On, uh, away from the attacking boat and assumed torpedo and uh, steadied up on a torpedo evasion course, which was fortunate by a matter of feet for Turner Joy. But that's story down the road a ways. So, the, so anyway, here we were with uh, two torpedoes inbound. Uh, and when the torpedoes were launched, that second boat peeled off and uh, uh, it stayed for a little time um, using its machine gun uh, before it turned. But it, when it turned, the captain directed the total fire now up on that leading boat, that, which by then was also coming in. So we had the two torpedoes in the water, and they were right on the surface. You could see the wakes. Um, so the captain didn't maneuver then, because he still wanted to use his guns uh, against that boat and the one up ahead. Uh, so we kept on, although the torpedoes, it was obvious that with the lead, they were going to be hitting us. So we were getting reports from uh, all over the ship, torpedo in the water, uh, highly excited. Um, and we didn't turn. Uh, I remember the Commodore came up uh, from combat and uh, uh, it was sort of funny. Uh, he here guns blazing away and uh, torpedoes coming in, reports from all over. You know, fire in a magazine, this and that and the other thing. All that's going on. So uh, it's like you see in the old prints in the Civil War with officers, you know, standing around in the middle of the battle with the hands and very calm, you know. Uh, well, so he was leaning against the open door and, and watching it. And he says, and the torpedoes were, I mean, it was a matter of half a minute maybe before we were in deep trouble. Uh, so he says, oh, Herb, you know, was Captain, don't you think it may be time to turn? <laughs> uh, so uh, he, he, uh, Captain didn't bother with a high ice or he, 
it was time to turn. So he had me uh, put the rudder on and, and evade. So we turned away um, and uh, just got her steadied up. The torpedo came of the, I only saw one, that was a close one. And that was right immediately within oh, eight feet. Passed us, par paralleled perfectly, real close. I could see the paint on it, the printing, um, rust, metal, as the thing went by. Um, and uh, uh, so meanwhile, that went by, uh, missed, obviously. And then, so now we've got this other boat coming in, the last one. And... Uh, and we, I don't know, we'd cranked out about 300 rounds in about 20 minutes, uh, as I recall the time, from total firing time. And the last shot in the five inch um, landed squarely in the cockpit of this last boat. And I could see the two torpedo tubes flying through the air, pieces of the cockpit flying. Didn't slow the boat down, but it did break off and uh, chase the others. Well, meanwhile, the planes arrived on top. Um, and uh, uh, so we got out of the way because the planes were coming around now to attack the boats. The planes, uh, they were, as I recall, F-8 Crusaders. They had the Zuni rockets and I think 20 millimeter. Um, anyway, they, they would fire the rockets. You could see the exhaust, and when the boats saw the exhaust, they would jiggle off to the side. Now, the burning boat was underway again. So all three of them were going back. We later got the report. Uh, one boat had the beach on the island there, because it was sinking, um, so they were they were hit pretty hard. Uh, but anyway, so the planes didn't hit the boats because the boats got out of the way. Um, it, what did happen? Well, the boats were firing back at the planes, and uh, so we got the report that one of the F-8s was hit and in trouble. So we manned up the rescue detail, a whale boat, and so forth, expecting to have to go uh, pull him out. Um, as it turned out, he just pulled too sharp a turn and overstressed his wings. So he'd come up with some sort of a damage report on that, I think, that um, was misconstrued when it got to us. Anyway, that was not a problem. What did happen, which is I earned my retirement. Um, what had happened now, we had, the planes were going in, the boats were headed back. We were still on that course away from the scene, but now we we're going to come around and chase the boats. Um, and so, brought the ship around towards the action. Well, what had happened, that torpedo that had passed us ran out of steam. We passed it, but didn't know it. So when we came around, we were right into it. It was just, I had the deck and the con, and uh, of course, when you have the kind of ship, you're looking at the road ahead all, pretty much all the time. So I looked down, and here is this torpedo exactly right lined up with our bow, just lolloping along like that, um, barely moving, but moving a little bit. And we were high speed, headed exactly for, for the thing. And that couldn't be more than, I don't know, 
80 feet away, which is virtually nothing. So I hollered out real loud, a torpedo under the bow, um, everybody around, uh, right full rudder, uh, starboard engine uh, back full, uh, left the port engine going, uh, and was so with a right full rudder on, I wanted to get the get out of the way of the thing, and and with the engines twisting, that helped the turn. So we came around just and did just in time. So the torpedo was coming in. We were then turning and swinging our stern into it. So I shifted the engines, shifted the rudder, and fishtailed around it. Um, so it came on in and just, I, I lost it in the foam alongside. So I don't know whether it grazed us or not. But it must have come within a foot of, you know, of us anyway to be in that foam because our stern was swinging in uh, around it. So it missed us, um, but it was an um, exciting minute and a half or two minutes. Um, so that um, was uh, my big adventure for the day. Uh, we didn't really sink them or blow them out of the water. Uh, uh, the uh, same three that came out went back. You know, and as I say, a radio report indicated one had the beach. And uh, later radar, radio report was that one of those that had been damaged had been repaired to be able to make the night attack. Um, so um, they made it back. The next thing, August, well, we were ordered to maintain, continue the patrol and to uh, go south and pick up Turner Joy to assist us. So we went south and got the, uh, uh, we rearmed, got more ammunition. A um, couple of side stories just to go back. During the firing, we of course ran out of ammunition in the in the uh, lockers, ready service lockers. So uh, damage control party aft uh, started handling ammunition out of the magazine to get them sent up. So our chief uh, got a, was awarded a, a letter or a Navy commendation medal for his initiative in organizing that ammo resupply uh, situation. Um, so anyway, um, we went down to rearm ammunition and so forth, and to pick up Turner Joy. And then came back and we night steamed out in the center of the Gulf. We didn't want to be close in and vulnerable. So uh, that night of the third, well, uh, second uh, night of um, second third, we were out in the Gulf, long ways out, which we also went uh, into um, the next night too, but uh, leading into the action on the fourth. Now, apparently, the North Vietnamese Navy noticed us going out into the Gulf, so it looked like they had spotted uh, attack boats out around the whole um, sea area. And um, for some sort of a constrictor uh, uh, attack on us that night. Because um, uh, as we went out that night to night steam, we start, started picking up 
radar contacts coming in at a long range. We were getting ducting. That means that the weather layers were such that it would, our surface radar, usually sort of short line of sight, was getting long range is because the, the beam was being bent by the weather conditions. Weather conditions that night, uh, it was uh, stormy, dark, no light at all, uh, seas fairly heavy uh, due to the storm, uh, uh, squalls, it felt like. Um, and uh, when we started picking up radar contacts, it looked like it was coming in we decided to leave the Gulf. So uh, we put Turner Joy astern of us a double standard distance in a column. So in other words, we were headed out, we were in a line with him half a mile astern. Uh, so that was the formation we were headed out. Uh, the, with, it's been said that we were tracking bird, fl flocks of birds uh, clouds, um, and there weren't any boats, as we were told by whoever, you know, critics. Um, it was fairly easy to pick out weather because it went at the same direction, speed as the wind, uh, and also the quality of the radar, the return, tends to be a little mushy. Um, with birds, uh, it's it's not a strong contact. So you can tell a lot by the quality of the radar the returns. Um, however, when the thing changes course to um, intercept, you, you tend to be suspicious, not only because they were possible boats, but also because they were being controlled by somebody with good radar coverage, knew what we were doing, where we were. About what time was this? Oh, must have been, I don't know, um, what, 2,800, 2,100, probably eight or nine o'clock, uh, the DRT trace would, would tell us. This is a skunk uniform that we began uh, assume, uh, being concerned about as a potential threat. So we were tracking him, and this is time 2111. So anyway, we were on our way out of the Gulf. Uh, we thought we also picked up aircraft too, I'm not quite sure of that. Um, and then uh, we started picking up Apparently, two boats together, uh, close aboard, close together, tracking us, paralleling us. Uh, then it looked like, as I remember, um, they started coming in. So anyway, we by now we both ships were at general quarters, and expecting trouble. Um, the boat, we, we noticed, we were locked onto one boat for sure, and I'm not quite sure, I think maybe both, but uh, one anyway. Now both ships were tracking him, with both with uh, fire control radar, which is quite accurate, and both with surface search radar. So it was a very solid contact, both ships had it by four different radars tracking the thing. And it was coming in at about 45 knots. So, I mean, <laughs> in our minds there was no question, but it was an attack run. Uh, so it made that jink to, the, to its left. Uh, bit, uh, we tracked it with the radar, so we, at that time, we thought uh, for sure that he'd launched. 
So we ordered the um, emergency turn, immediate emergency turn, uh, with a turn order. Why, as I say, both ships turn together rather than a corpin where you come down and turn. You know, since we wanted to turn both uh, and then steadied up on an evasion course, uh, which with any luck would parallel the torpedo. And if it, if it hit you, it'd blow the other end of the ship off, uh, engines and rudders and so forth. And maybe you could save a third of the crew from the forward end, where most of the crew would be. That's one of the considerations. So anyway, uh, the angels were with us. Uh, yeah, there's a torpedo. Uh, and uh, it missed the uh, Turner Joy uh, very, very closely. Uh, they could see the wake. Four people in Turner Joy saw the torpedo wake for sure. Um, one was the after gun director crew, two people there, um, including the uh, director officer who was also, as I recall, the ASW officer who knew about torpedoes. Um, then there was also the port lookout. It passed the port side. Port lookout saw it. Also the gun director, uh, a guy, a listed man up in the forward gun director, also saw it. So there's four competent seamen that saw the torpedo. There's no mistaking a torpedo, uh, either at daylight or at night. At night, you can see the phosphorescent wake, very bright. And uh, I can describe it as a pencil straight line, very thin line, very fast. It's going at 45 knots. The ship is going about 25, 28 knots. Uh, so at sea, 45 is a very high speed uh, you know, in the water. Um, Obviously, um, not a dolphin. Uh, one of the uh, enlisted men were, when we went to Subic for the investigation, um, one of the senior people there, I don't know, officers, I don't know, uh, asked me if he thought it was, was if it might have been a porpoise. Um, uh, what was, there were a few explicative uh, words mixed with that. <laughs> Anybody that's ever seen a blankety blank torpedo knows it isn't a blankety blank <laughs> porpoise. <laughs> so it's, which is true. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no uh, confusion about that whatsoever. And it was visually sighted. Uh, now, I want to point out at this point that um, when Park, Sonerman Park aboard our ship, reviewed all the hydrophone effects or sounds underwater later on, took about three days, I, as I recall, um, he was not able to pick that up. I don't know why but he didn't. Um, there were also, when he did that review, he said he didn't pick up any torpedo noises or any uh, noises that were not ship related. Um, and I just want to insert the comment so I don't forget it, that when the ensuing action from this first attack, run in, uh, We had aircraft that were in support, and a number of planes came right down on the deck to look for surface contacts. I mean, they're really low. Um, and I remember three instances, at least. There may have been another one. But the plane would come down and level out, and the sonar would pick it up immediately. Now, this is highly unusual that a sonar is that good, that it can track an aircraft. Now and then they would pick up helos, 
that were hovering and putting a lot of noise in the water low with their, with their blades. This is the first time in my experience that a sonar had ever picked up a jet, but it did. Sonar was on it immediately, high speed jet low, and tracked the thing. Exactly. And when the plane uh, climbed out, the contact was lost. Now that happened exactly that way three times. My training on the bridge is OD. Any kind of hydrophone effect, uh, you check the bearing visually immediately to see what's out there, what's causing the, uh, the sound contact. So this was a normal action with, on my part, particularly in the middle of this melee, and there's absolutely no question it's an aircraft, it's got the lights on, it's got the bearing, you got the whole thing being tracked, uh, and there's no question about it at all. But Park didn't pick up that, those jets. even though his sonar did. So there's some sort of a problem there. A jet aircraft engine is not anything related to ship's noise. Um, so I'm questioning the accuracy of Parks, where well, he's an he's a experienced, qualified sonarman, but for some reason uh, that was not picked up. Um, so if something like that happened three times, what about any kind of oversight before with a torpedo, a high-speed turbine sound? So anyway, that, that was my note I wanted to, to add on. Uh, so anyway, back again now to uh, Turner Joy, and they reported the port torpedo uh, that, that had missed him. And so at that time, I, was, I received the order from Captain Ogier um, in Maddox that I was to assume that any hydrophone effect report from sonar was to be treated as a torpedo and to evade it. Now, uh, that is the source of a big, you know, a lot of heartburn everywhere. Because every time this hydrophone effect uh, was reported to the bridge and to combat, um, I evaded it and it was reported to the ship, to the whole ship, torpedo in the water, etc. Now, for some reason, this is also transmitted by radio, not only to Turner Joy, but to Washington. Uh, through the Philippines and so on. It was purely tactical information. They had no business knowing any of this. And I think there were 29 or 23 of these kind of emergency maneuvering on hydrophone effect reports. Uh, probably two, maybe three of those were valid boats. The rest was own ship's noise uh, or Turner Joy um, itself, other than the aircraft, uh, and we knew at the time that's what it was, because I knew how to determine what was what, bearing drift or no bearing drift as we turned with full rudder and so on, and we'd leave knuckles of water when the rudders would kick and leave a, a, a sonar contact at that swirl point. Uh, and ship's noise would be generated in the turn and, and so on and so forth. So we knew at the time that the, most of these were um, not attacks. But my orders were to evade, and the warning went out to God knows where. I mean, it's all over. 
So I can imagine back in Washington, there aren't that many torpedoes in the whole Pacific. Uh, and so what, what kind of fool's game are they playing out there? And since then, all this was seen on, as confusion on our part. We didn't know what we were doing, shooting at anything, uh, and so forth. Um, so it's a very unfortunate situation, but that's what happened. Uh, Turner Joy now and then saw reported boats in our wake. At one time, uh, that was too close in for us to see inside our sea return from the radar. So I, at one time we thought we'd roll a depth chart, a couple depth charges, shake them out. So we did, uh, for some, and told the engine room that we were rolling them, but somehow it didn't get back to all the troops aft. So they thought we had our rear end blown off when those depth charges went. <laughs> uh, we didn't do that anymore, but it was, uh, I mean, it's just one of those things that happened. Um, and uh, uh, so here we were, all these radical turns going on. Uh, Turner Joy saw they had a re solid contact radar. It was under fire. They saw the explosion, smoke, then reported that. Um, uh, so their people also saw silhouettes, I think, of uh, a boat against uh, flashes of the gunfire. Our, one of our people saw a silhouette of a boat. We threw a few, three inch out in that direction, and in the flash he saw the silhouette. And they were able to draw P4 silhouettes, never having seen one before. Um, None of this was accepted as evidence, however, later on. Um, also, our Marine contingent, they were, I'll tell you, I, we knew that the plan, North Vietnamese plan, was to uh, come out and uh, uh, take us under uh, torpedo uh, and um, uh, gunfire, heavy, uh, they had Swatow patrol boats with a heavier armament. And to put us dead in the water, killing one third of the crew, ship probably on fire from all of that, then to board us, take the ship, kill another third of the crew in boarding. And that, so this was their overall plan. So uh, we were on board, we were given flak jackets from World War II B-17s a masonite, it looked like, kind of things, uh, 45s, and uh, ampules to inject um, morphine kind of deal. Uh, but the Marines, you know, all that was just stage show. What could we do with a 45 being boarded? So anyway, uh, the Marines, the detachment, uh, were, were great. They set up a field of fire from the signal bridge so they could control the main deck aft. Uh, and we had some Browning, some BARs, Browning automatic rifles, pretty heavy things, and a few 30 caliber pop guns. But anyway, the Marines had those and they were stationed up there, uh, really good for morale. Uh, but the sergeant and one of his troops saw a, a boat coming up alongside, port side, pass us, close aboard. Nobody told him to shoot, so they didn't. It's a Marine thing, I guess. You have to have an order from somebody to shoot. Uh, so anyway, because you didn't want to hit friends, I guess. Uh, anyway, they didn't shoot. So the boat went up forward, passed us, up, uh, crossed our bow, and then came down on the other side. So they saw that too. Um, so that was, of course, that was not evidence either. Um, so I think that what with the visual sightings, oh, and also another thing, when this attack first started, we reported to Washington that they're under fire. 
Well, our intelligence people also picked up the report from them, the enemy, that they had attacked. Uh, it started the attack, so that occurred in, in time and place. Um. I wrote the after action report as ops officer on the flagship. Yeah, well, they, Turner Joy would have also had to write their report, but I wrote the one that uh, uh, for our ship and for the Commodore. Um, I couldn't put any of the intelligence in, and they couldn't talk. I'm not sure the president or Congress was given this special intelligence. I mean, that was, uh, at the, since then, this has been written about. Um, so I'm assuming there's, it's no longer uh, special intelligence. But at the time, it was. And so, obviously, this was not, had not gotten into Congress and, and Tonkin Golf Resolution people or anything. Uh, as far as I know, if the president and, and I'm not even sure Sec Def at that time is, was given the I don't know who got it back there, but I know it was very tight. And the way the reports have been written since, the interviews since, uh, by these people that made the decisions in Congress, it doesn't sound like they knew. Now, years later, I think 10 years later, the saying came up again and that information was released to them. Uh, I know that. I, at that time, I was on the staff at ASW-4 Land. Uh, ASW Forces Atlantic, which is also a NATO job in Norfolk. And that's at the, the time that this commission assembled to review the whole thing. Um, I was, they contacted me as a potential witness, but they, then they decided they didn't need me, so I didn't have to go out. Do I want to talk about McNamara? No, I would prefer not to talk about McNamara. After the war, he got together with some drinking buddy, his equivalent over in the North Vietnam side, and he was told that no, the attack never happened. So he believes this joker from the North Korean side and not us. So I don't want to talk about the McNamara. Uh, all due respect, if he's, I don't know even if he's alive now or not, probably not. Uh, but and I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but I feel betrayed by the guy for for that. Anyway, I tend to be emotional, and maybe uh, maybe it's time to just let it go and pay attention to other things.